الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا عبد القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعما بعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم حسين مني وأنا من الحسين صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. I express my condolences to all of you, to the Imam of our age and to Mu'mineen and Mu'minat worldwide in these days when we're commemorating the shahada not only of Imam Hussain alayhi salam and the sacrifice of his companions but bil khusus the shahada of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajal. So night before last we began a series of discussions concerned with the family of Hazrat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one thing we tried to make clear is that Ahlul Bayt al-Rasul alayhi wa sallam, they are the continuation of that covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made with Hazrat Ibrahim. And we covered that I think the first night discussing these issues primarily from the Bible. Last night we continued that discussion by mentioning Surah Al-Kawthar and showing that the covenant that Allah made with Hazrat Ibrahim السلام, is fulfilled in the person of Hazrat Fatima Zahra السلام, that it's through Hazrat Fatima السلام, that Imamat is kept in the Nasr of Ibrahim through Prophet Muhammad and it's through Hazrat Zahra alayhi salam that the children and the descendants of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam became so numerous so that today they have fulfilled that promise of Allah to make the descendants of Hazrat Ibrahim as multiple as the stars in the sky. Today the largest single family on the face of the earth is the family of Hazrat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi now tonight I want to start changing gears a little bit with you, change direction a little bit with you. We often think of Imam Hussein's movement as having only one side. And we pay attention all too often only to this one side, and that is that tragic side. Bring this closer, will it help? Just don't put it in my way. I like to see the people. <laughs> it's very important when you're speaking with the people to be able to see them and they also. Listen, it shouldn't be pointing them. toward the mic. Make it back toward them. Yeah. No, bring it on this side. Switch it around, you mean? Yeah. Better? Okay, so it's better now? Yeah. Fine. So as I was saying, we often pay attention to only one side of Imam Hussein's movement. We often pay attention to only this one aspect of Imam Hussein's movement. When there's various aspects and various sides to Imam Hussein's movement. This evening I want to begin discussing that aspect of Imam Hussein's movement that is concerned with the aspect of male and female. You know, in Islam, if you just listen to the news, if you just watch the news, they have a very negative perception of how Muslims think of women. And they're always doing some negative propaganda against the Muslims, that you Muslims, you don't treat your women right. When actually nothing could be further from the truth. There's a long history in the religion of Allah, in Quran, as well as in Islam, of the leadership and influential positions amongst women. And so this evening we want to begin discussing that and inshallah we'll 
continue this discussion tomorrow night as well. So please send a loud salawat so we can begin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You have to send a better salawat than that if you want to be in Imam Mahdi's army. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As the Imam's army, you can be brought up for court martial in these type of things. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Often when we hear about women in Islam, we think about those Ahlul Bayt, right? Hazrat Zahra alayhi salam, Hazrat Zainab al-Kubra alayhi salam. This evening, let's begin our discussion all the way back with Hazrat Adam and Hazrat Hawa alayhi salam. In the Bible, when they discuss the experience of Hazrat Adam and Hazrat Hawa in the garden, they give you one particular view of it that is very Western, and this particular view has influenced Western society, Western culture, to bring them to where they are now. In the Bible, when they discuss, as an example, when they discuss the treachery of shaitan and the misleading of shaitan, they put all the blame on Hazrat Hawa. How the story goes is this in the Bible. They say that after the shaitan saw that these two were living peaceably and comfortably in the Garden of Eden, then the shaitan first approached Adam to try to mislead him and to convince him to eat from that tree that was forbidden for him. In the Bible, shaitan fails to mislead Adam. So he approaches the quote-unquote weaker sex. And he's successful in the Bible in misleading Hawa. And they blame Hawa then for misleading Adam. And for this reason, you have this concept in Christian theology and in Western society that a woman is the root of sin. Because of this whole story and their interpretation of this story. But when we look at Quran and what Quran says about this story and what Quran says, we see that Quran clearly states that shaitan approached both of them and misled both of them. And that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to find out or knows about their being misled and eating from this tree that was forbidden for them, then what happens is he puts the blame in Quran on both of them. Now why is this so important to us? Because it makes the point absolutely clear that in the religion of Allah, men and women are equal before Allah. That in the physical world and in the law, there may be some differences according to rights and abilities and capabilities. However, in Islam, men and women before Allah, in the eyes of Allah, are completely equal. And we see this in the story of Adam and Hawa, in how Allah puts the blame on both of them. Now very quickly we should make this clear, just give me a little time this evening, as to why we Muslims say that Adam did not sin when he ate this fruit. Because this is something that a lot of Muslims have a lot of trouble understanding. Allah told him not to eat from the tree. But Adam went and ate from the tree. So how come it's not a sin? Prophets don't sin. How come we don't consider this a sin? To understand the secret of this, we should understand how Allah created Adam and then what processes took place after that. So please send us a one. Allahumma salli Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he announces to the angels that verily, surely, I desire and I plan to place a Khalifa in the earth. And the angel said to Allah, would you create something that will make mischief and bloodshed while we glorify your name and extol your praise? The angels, when they said this, it shows that they have some knowledge of what a human being is and what a human being is capable of. And many of the Mufassirin, they say that the reason for this is because there was a creation before Adam. 
Adam is our first grandfather from human beings like us. But there was creation before Adam. And these angels may have had some experience with that creation, and so they assumed that Adam would be like that. And they said, look, you're going to make something that's going to make a whole lot of trouble, a whole lot of mischief, and a whole lot of bloodshed. Allah says to the angels, surely I know what you do not know, and he created Adam, and he placed him in the garden, and we see very clearly that when he made Adam, after creation of Adam, what's the first thing that he does? He educates Adam. So after he's created, Adam is educated. Quran says, and Allah taught him the names, all of them. Now some of us even say that these names that Adam were taught were the names of everything that was created. So he said, this is a tree, this is a bush, this is some grass, that's a rock, and these were the names that were taught to Adam. Other Mufassirin say that no, these names that were taught to Hazrat Adam were the names of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. And for this reason, Adam learned these names and memorized them. So now, Adam has been created. Adam has been educated. After this educational process, Allah brings Adam before the angels and tells the angels, bow down to Adam. All of the angels bow down and Quran says, except Iblis. Now don't get confused. Iblis was not an angel. He was a jinn that had elevated himself to the rank of those angels through his worship of Allah. However, in this one instance, shaitan destroyed himself in seconds. How? Because of qiyas. Because of guessing and assuming that because Adam was made from clay and he was made from fire, that he was better than Adam. So he refused to do sajda to Adam. Now this got shaitan in considerable trouble with Allah, but that portion of the story will save for another day. What's important here is that Allah creates Adam, educates Adam, and because of this aql, because of this education and this intellect that Allah trains Adam in, this is what puts Adam and Bani Adam and human beings above even the angels. It's our intellect that makes us different from the jinns from the other animals, and from even the angels. Because you see, we can choose good or bad. Just like Adam is made from mud and the spirit of Allah, we also can choose. Do we want to be muddy and dirty? Or do we want to go with the spirit and be pure and clean? So Adam is created. Adam is educated. And then, what good is education unless you have a test? You guys all go to school? Some of you in elementary or high school, many of you probably already in college. When you go to school and you learn something, you get a test, don't you? You got midterms, you got finals, you got weekly tests, and if you got a very mean teacher, she might drop a pop quiz on you come Monday morning. You brothers ready? <laughs> Monday's right around the corner, you've had two weeks off. We were talking to a brother last night. He's like, I got a rush, I had two weeks to do my work. And I didn't do anything, and now tonight I have to do everything. But there's tests when you get education. So Adam is educated. Adam is endowed with freedom of choice. But what good is freedom of choice if you don't understand consequences? What good is a choice if you don't understand what the fallout of choices are? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests Adam. He says, Adam, you and your wife can live here in this garden, in this paradise, man. Do whatever you like. Eat as you like, but don't go near this tree. Now look, I'm sure many of you have children. If you take a kid in a candy store, and you tell him, look, choose anything you want, but you can't have this one. What's the child going to do? He's going to demand this one. Because you already focused his attention on this one. This is the same case with Adam. Allah says, eat whatever you like, but don't go near this tree. This is a test for Adam. This is also part of his educational process. What good is his intellect? What good is his free choice if he doesn't understand the consequences of freedom? So Allah sets the, the test up. Eat as you like, but don't go near this tree. Adam eats from the tree. And as Quran says, he comes to realize 
that he's made a mistake. Would he have ever learned about good and bad if he didn't make this mistake? No. Imam Ali alayhi salam says you cannot know good unless you know evil. It, it can't happen. If you've got somebody living secluded from evil, he'll never be able to make a proper choice. So this test is set up for Adam. And Adam, by failing the test, gets full realization of what exactly is freedom of choice. Now, there's a very easy way to explain this, but I went through this long story so that you can get a grasp for it. When you learn something, then you need to be tested in that something that you've learned. And sometimes it's in our benefit to fail a test. How many of us have failed the test? And by failing the test, now we understand our weaknesses. We took a test in, I don't know, multiplication and division of fractions. And we understood when we got the F that we didn't learn multiplication and division of fractions. This was the case with Adam. Adam was educated and now had to learn the consequences of choices and he learned this. And this is why we say it was not a sin for Adam. This entire test was actually just a continuation of his educational process. So I just wanted to point that out for you very quickly. Please, salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So from the very beginning, we should make this clear that we as Muslims, we do not believe that Hazrat Hava, Eve, is in any way responsible for the misleading of Adam. In addition to this, Christians say that spare parts were taken from Adam to create Hawa. We don't believe in this either. Adam was a creation of Allah. And no parts, spare parts were taken from him. He didn't take an extra alternator. He didn't take an extra battery and put it into this and create that. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and Hawa as creations of his. So in this way, we see that the human beings, male and female, are equal in the eyes of Allah. But here's another example of the role of women in the development of religion from the beginning of time. And we mentioned this example very briefly before, the example of Hazrat Ibrahim and the example of his wife, Sarah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran reveals to Hazrat Ibrahim that he's going to bless him with a son, he sends the angel, and the angel begins speaking to Hazrat Ibrahim, telling him, I bring good news to you about the birth of a son. And Sarah was in the room with Adam. I mean, Sarah was in the room with Hazrat Ibrahim. She says, huh, will a son be born to me in my old age? And many times we read this verse of Quran and skip right over it and pay no attention. But Sarah is hearing the angel of Allah reveal what to the Prophet of Allah. Can women be prophets? No. But here is a woman hearing the conversation of an angel with Hazrat Ibrahim. In this way we see that women can attain such a high spiritual position that they can even hear the wahi. Even though they're not a prophet, even though they're not an imam, their spiritual status can be that high that they can even hear the angels conversing with the Prophet of Allah. Salam so in Islam and in divine religion from the beginning of time there's been this concept that in the eyes of Allah men and women are equal and they share an equal portion in building history and in developing religion another example from Quran the example of Hazrat Maryam Hazrat Maryam salam, she's not a prophet She's not an imam. She's the mother of Nabi Isa. But yet Allah sends angels to speak to her. So if she's not a prophet and if she's not an imam, then why should an angel come and speak to her? It's because her spiritual status was that high. It's because her position in the eyes of Allah was that high. So we see that in Quran, women have attained on numerous occasions that high high position, the angels converse with them. Look at Hazrat Zakaria. 
in the time of Hazrat Maryam, Hazrat Zakaria السلام, was the prophet of Allah to Bani Israel. Yet when he entered the room of Hazrat Maryam, he would go down on bended knee out of respect for her. He would bow to Hazrat Maryam because of her high status. And this is the prophet of Allah showing that deep respect to this woman. So one thing we should make clear then, the position of woman in religion, divine religion, and in Islam is just as high and on par with, and many times even higher than that of men. So no one should be looking down on the women. But what about in the history of Islam? What about this religion? This Islam, has it also been built and developed? And has it also progressed at the hands of women? Of course. Send us salawat and I'll explain how. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I suppose the best and most poignant example of this, what we're discussing, is the example of Hazrat Khadija alayhi salam. Hazrat Khadija alayhi salam was that first wife of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. And lots of times you hear people say <coughs> Hazrat Khadija alayhi salam was the richest woman of Arabia. Don't believe the hype. She wasn't the richest woman of Arabia. She was the richest person of Arabia. <laughs> because if Mecca is the center of trade in Arabia, then understand that one of Hazrat Khadija's trade caravans was equal to all of the trade caravans of the Quraysh. Her one caravan was equal to all the caravans of all of Quraysh. She had inherited this business from her father. And it was a well-founded, well-run business when her father handed it over to her. But she built this business up even more than that so that she became the richest person, male or female, of all of Arabia. The time came when she needed a trusted advisor and a trusted manager. And who did she turn to? Al-Ameen. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now she could have gone to anybody else, but she chose Al Amin. And his performance in her service is known in history. When he takes one of her caravan to Sham, and they arrive on the outskirts of the capital of Syria to do their business. All of the other Arab tribes, they rushed into town to sell their goods because the idea here is to get into town, sell everything you got, and hit the road, get back to Mecca. Hazrat Muhammad وسلم, as the manager of this caravan, when he reaches to the outskirts and he sees everybody rushing into town, he says, whoa, y'all kick it. Chill, we're not going into town right now. Everybody's like, but if we don't go into town now, we're gonna lose business. They're gonna sell everything and then it'll all be gone. Hazrat Nabi says, no way. These old guys, they rush into town, they sell what they gotta sell and they get out of town. Nabi Muhammad, he leads this caravan into town after everybody's left. And when he shows up now, it, it turns out that the goods that he has brought are different from those goods that were brought in those caravans before. And because these goods are in such high demand, he's able to make double, triple, quadruple the money that these other people were able to make. And in this way, he's able to return to Hazrat Khadija salam, with this huge reward for business. So Hazrat Khadija salam, she, her wealth was constantly on the grow. After she marries Prophet Muhammad wasallam, you read in history about these slaves that accepted Islam and were freed. What do you think? You think Abu Bakr had the bank to free all those slaves? Do you think Umar had that money to free all those slaves? What about Uthman? He was too busy stealing money to spend any money to free people. Thank you, brother. It was the wealth of Hazrat Khadija that freed those slaves. When those kuffar of Mecca 
put Bani Hashim and the Muslims under an embargo and move them into that Shaykh Abi Talib. It was the wealth of Hazrat Khadija that kept the Muslims alive. What happens in an embargo? In an embargo, a black market develops, doesn't it? Black market develops and things are sold at twice, three times, four times the price. Don't think that these makans were above selling in the black market. Even during this embargo, there was still sales going on to keep supplies going in. They were running the embargo and getting supplies to those Muslims and those members of Bani Hashim who were under embargo. But it was a very high price. And it was the wealth of Khadija that brought Islam through these dark years, that brought Islam and the Muslims through this embargo so that those children of the Muslims and those children of Bani Hashim never went hungry, never went thirsty, because Hazrat Khadija salam, expended her wealth in the way of Islam such that by the time she passes away, she's penniless. Even a kafan isn't there for her. Hazrat Rasul has to bury Mama Khadija in his shirt, so that the worms of the earth won't attack her body. Hazrat Khadija made Islam possible for me and you today. Don't think that it was all just in Prophet's hand. Prophet did his job, and he had to fulfill his mission. But if there was no Khadija, there would be no Islam. It was her money, her wealth, her khulus and niyat, her pure intentions that guided this community through those dark years in Mecca so that today we could be here in this hall, in this majlis, reciting the Salawat. majlis of Imam Hussein. Salawat. Allah. 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 Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So this was the role of Hazrat <laughs> And this should show you that from the very beginning of Islam, women have been at the forefront. Women have been at the very front of the battle. Another example is her daughter, Hazrat Fatima, alayhi <laughs> salam. Hazrat Fatima was so highly respected by the Prophet that when she entered the room, he would stand up. That the Prophet of Allah showed that respect to this woman, not just because she's his daughter, but because she's a Zahra. He would stand up and give her in the family gatherings the position of honor. He himself would move and give Hazrat Zahra that position. As she grew and matured into a woman, and she married Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You see that Hazrat Zahra established a school in her own home where she would teach ahkam, the laws of Islam, recitation of Qur'an to the Muslims, and particularly the Muslim women. So that she was raising the standard of education in Medina, specifically amongst the women, to that status that it was apparent that these people were learning and growing. And we gave this example a couple of nights ago. Look at this. We have so many ahadith that men came to Prophet and asked him a question. And we have much fewer hadith about women <coughs> going to the Prophet and asking questions. Now they exist. There are ahadith where women go to Prophet and voice their concerns and speak with Prophet and get answers. But not nearly as much as men going to Prophet. Why? Because Hazrat Zahra alayhi salam in Medina was the women's link to Prophet. Why should they go and ask Prophet when Hazrat Zahra is available? When Hazrat Zahra can give the answers like her father would. When Hazrat Zahra is that acquainted with Islam that she can give the tafsir of Quran and teach the people Quran and recitation of Quran and laws of Islam just as well as Prophet. Because she had been trained by Prophet. So the house of Hazrat Fatima alayhi salam becomes a base of Islam. And as we mentioned before, this is why those who 
kuffar, those enemies of Islam, attacked the house of Fatima. It's not because they wanted Ali. They can get Ali anytime they want. They attacked the house of Fatima alayhi salam because the house of Fatima is now a base of Islam in Medina. And if you want to destroy Ahlul Bayt, if you want to destroy Islam, you must destroy this base of Islam. And look again at Hazrat Zahra. You think she was hiding in her back room, cowering in the closet, pulling her veil over her face when these Malawin were outside threatening her? No. When they showed up and started stacking firewood at the door, Hazrat Zahra salam, was behind that door. And she was speaking to the people outside. Hazrat Zahra is on the front lines of this battle. When those people go to light that fire, Hazrat Zahra shouts out, Will you burn down this house with me and my children in it? And number two, he responds, burning down your house is better than anything your father ever did. This is the quote of this number two. Burning down the house of Az-Zahra is better than anything Rasulullah ever did? Have you gone crazy, Ya Umar? When they lit the fire, Az-Zahra was behind the door. When they kicked the door, Az-Zahra was behind the door. She was on the front lines of this battle, defending Islam, defending Wilayat, defending Imamat. Salawat. This is why we call Hazrat Zahra a Shahida. She's a martyr. She died on the battlefield. She died from wounds that she received on the front lines of the battle to defend Islam. She is 100% a martyr of Islam. And her example was transferred to her daughter, <coughs> Hazrat Zainab al-Kubra. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. As we've mentioned before, Hazrat Zainab, salam alayha, the sister of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein, when he's ready to leave Medina, he tells his sister, come with me. Her husband Abdullah ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar comes and says, Oh Imam, can I also come with you? And Imam says, No, you can't come. And people would wonder, well, why would Imam tell Zainab's husband to stay, but would tell Zainab to come? And the reason for that is this, Zainab is going to be the leader of this caravan after Imam Hussein, and there should be no wali above Zainab. There should be no master to come and tell Zainab, don't do this, do that. So Abdul ibn Jafar al-Tayyar is left behind because Zainab is expected to lead this caravan. When they set out from Medina, we see Hazrat Zainab salam, showing those typical traits of a woman, showing those typical characteristics of a woman. She would often break down in tears just at the thought of her husband, of her brother being killed. Just at the idea of Imam Hussein being taken away from her was terrifying to Zainab. But we see that after Karbala, Zainab, Zainab changes. Zainab no longer shows those quote unquote typical frailties of a woman. Now she's strong, she's in charge. And to show you the level at which this caravan accepted Zainab as their leader, when this caravan enters the court of Ibn Ziyad in Kufa, the women of this caravan are surrounding Zainab. Zainab has not slept in three or four days by this time. She's tired, she's hungry. She's been tortured. She's been mistreated by these chapters of hers. But her spirit is still not broken. When they enter the court of Ibn Ziyad, she doesn't say anything. You know, it was tradition that when you enter into the court of a powerful man, you should at least say, Salam Alay. You should call the man by his title, if his title is Qawdu Bila Amiru 
if his title is governor, whatever his title should be, then they should call him by that title. Zainab, she doesn't pay any attention to this. She doesn't even call Ibn Ziyad by his kunya, which is his nickname, Abu Khalid. She doesn't call Ibn Ziyad by his title as governor. She calls him Ibn Abu, son of your father, showing great disrespect. When they first enter the court, the women are huddled around Zainab. Zainab pays no attention. So Ibn Ziyad, he sees that these women have some respect for this woman in the middle of this crowd. And he says, who is this woman? No one answers. Not even Zainab herself. She doesn't answer. Again, he asks, who is this woman? Nobody answers. Not even Zainab. It's not worthy of a response from her. Finally, when he asks a third time, one of these ladies said, this is Zainab bint Ali. Hazrat Zainab alayhi salam, although she has seen all of these terrible sights, although she has witnessed all of these martyrdoms, still her spirit is unbroken. She's tired, she's hungry, she's thirsty, she's wounded. And yet, her strength is still there so that she shows no respect and no weakness in the face of the enemy. And this should show us that women have been at the forefront of the development and the defense of our religion from the very beginning. Just in the case of Islam, you have three generations of women protecting this religion, expounding on this religion, teaching this religion, the classes of Hazrat Zainab salam, were so well attended in Medina that when her father moved to Kufa, when Imam Ali moved the capital to Kufa so that he could better administer the government, Zainab moved with him. And many of her students, they moved also. They were so attached to their teacher, they were so in need of her knowledge that they couldn't think of themselves staying in Medina if Zainab is moving to Kufa. So when Zainab moved to Kufa with her father, they packed their bags too and went on the road with her. Her classes were established again in Kufa and were well attended in Kufa. And in this way, Hazrat Zainab salam, was educating the Muslims and educating bin Husus, Muslim women and raising their level little by little. In every instance, we see that this Zainab is at the forefront of the saving of Islam. And indeed, the movement of Imam Hussein alayhi salam is a movement that has two parts. The first part of his movement is a movement that focuses on the men and on their example of self-sacrifice, on their example of resistance. And on Yom Ashura, when their example is established and they show the Muslims how to deal with the Yazid, after Yom Ashura, it's the women of this caravan now that spread the message of Imam Hussein's resistance, that spread the message of Imam Hussein's message of self-sacrifice in defense of Islam. So oftentimes we have an idea, we have a misconception about the role of women in Islam. And our sisters especially should take this to heart. Zainab is your example. You should be more like Zainab. And I'm sure many of you are striving towards that already. But you see in Islam and in the development of Islam in this country, we cannot afford to cut the ladies out. They must be, as they always have been, equal partners in the development and in the protection and in the spreading and establishment of this religion. Salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Look at what Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salatu wa salam has said in his treatise on rights, Rasalatul Hukuk. Go and look it up online, Google it, Imam Zain al Abidin treatise on rights. If you have Sahifa to Sajjadiyah, the one that's translated into English, the Psalms of Islam, at the back of this book has the treatise of rights. 
I encourage everyone to go there and read those. It's very important. Men can learn what their rights are. Women can learn what their rights are. Mothers, fathers, children, everyone can learn from this as far as what their rights and their obligations are. Imam Zain al-Abideen salam, he says about women in this treatise of rights, particularly mothers, he says, mothers deserve this full respect and the full rights towards their children. Because mothers carry their children where no one carries anyone. And they endure that hardship. You know, your mother carried you for nine months. Sometimes when she laid on her back, she'd get heartburn. Other times, she felt crazy urges to eat different foods. All of this because she wanted to produce a safe and healthy child. How many women go through that hardship, nine months of labor, of carrying that child, walking around? Have you seen the pregnant women walk? When they get up to like eight or nine months, man, it's a struggle to get up, to sit down. And all of this they did for you? You think they were getting any benefit for themselves? When you were thirsty, they gave you something to drink, even if it meant they would be thirsty. When you were hungry, they would give you their last food. It doesn't matter if they're hungry as long as your stomach is full. When you were up, sleep, crying late at night and you were sick, was it your father who lost sleep with you? No. It was your mother who came in and cared for you and took care of you. This is the position and the role of the women. What, what would be family without women? The central focus of our families is our wives and our mothers. The reason men get up and go to work every day is because of these families. And the central focus of that family is mommy. You know, I tell my kids sometimes, I can make another one just like you, man. Mess with me. I brought you in, and I can take you out. <laughs> because I've got the car khane right here. I've got the factory right here. I'll make one that looks just like you. But the women can't replace a good wife. And you can't replace a good mother. And the level and the status of the women in Islam has been guaranteed and has been discussed to such an extent that we now should come to realize it that it's the women in Islam that have brought Islam to this level. Yes, the sacrifice of Imam Hussein and his companions saved Islam, but no one would have known of that sacrifice if it was not for Hazrat Zainab, salamu alayha. It would have been very easy for Banu Umayyah to cover the whole thing up. In fact, they almost succeeded. Don't think that they didn't try. These guys, man, look. They did their best to cover this up. First, they spread the rumor that this isn't Hussein ibn Ali. This is a brigand, a rebel. Even when they spread the news of the death of Imam Hussein, they spread the news saying there was a rebel from Hijaz who rose up against the government, and we killed him. Masajid were built to celebrate the killing of Imam Hussein under Banu Umayyah. Masjids were built to celebrate the killing of Imam Hussein because people thought that this was just some rebel. The enemy tried to cover this thing up, but it's the efforts of Zainab that exposed them. As we said earlier today, the worst thing that Banu Umayyah ever did was to imprison Zainab. <laughs> Imam Sadiq salam, says, Allah has blessed us with foolish enemies. <laughs> and it's the truth. If they were smart, they would have released Zainab. If they were smart, they would have sent her back to Medina. But they made a terrible mistake by moving her from town to town to town to town, from Karbala to Kufa, from Kufa to Sham, because at every place Zainab went, she was waking up the people, preaching. And understand, Yazid himself, when he faces Zainab, he's destroyed by Zainab in Balagha, in Fasah, Fasahat, in the 
eloquence of her speech. Those people who were around her said that her speech was on the level of the speech of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And Imam Ali is known as the most eloquent of the Muslims. This was the power. Zainab's tongue was more powerful than all of the swords of Banu Umayyah. And it was her efforts in defense of Islam that has Islam here and Tashayyo here where we are today. Salam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The enemy, they did their best to break Zainab. They tried their best to break her will and understand who Zainab. On the day of Ashura, after all of Imam Hussein's family members and companions have been killed, and only Imam Hussein alayhi salam remains, Imam Hussein established for himself near his tents a defensive position. He stayed near this position so that his family could know that he was alive for as long as possible. From this position, he would ride out, fight with the enemy, and kill them, and then return to this defensive position. And every time he rode out, they would hear the horse leave, and every time he returned, they would hear the horse return, and they would hear him saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al al And this was a comfort to Ahlubayt, to know that Imam Hussein is here on his horse, defending these tents. The honor of Imam Hussein salam, would not allow him to leave his family undefended. On that final valley of Imam Hussein, when he's killing those enemies, like the enemy reporters say, because understand, many of the reports we have from Karbala are from the enemy. The enemy brought reporters into the field too, just like today you have embedded reporters with the military and they take reports. The enemy also had reporters there who were recording everything. They say that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, that his fighting was like the fighting of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Even the general of that army said, what are you doing? You are facing the best of the Bani Hashim. You are facing the best of the Arabs. You cannot defeat him in one-to-one -one combat. And they call for the archers. From a distance, they shower arrows on Imam Hussein. From a distance, they load up their arrows and they fire at Imam Hussein. So many arrows that Riwayat says that Imam Hussein's body resembled the body of a porcupine or a hedgehog. So many arrows arrows were sticking out of him. And Zainab is witnessing this. When Hazrat Imam Hussein is filled with those arrows and he falls from his horse, they didn't hear the sound of a man's body hitting the ground. They heard the sound of arrows breaking. That his body was suspended between the earth and the sky on these arrows. And Zainab is seeing this. On the ground, Imam Hussein alayhi salam begins to gather some dirt. And Zainab is witnessing this. Those enemies, they're coming close to Imam Hussein. And they notice that Imam Hussein gathers this dirt and makes sajda. And they hear him saying something after this sajda. As the enemies draw close, they're all trembling because still they're afraid of Imam Hussein. They don't know, is this a trick on his part that he's trying to draw them in and thus with his last bit of strength kill a few of them? So they're trembling and they're afraid. But they hear Imam Hussein saying something. And Zainab is looking. And they hear Imam Hussein saying, yes. Yes, give me the water. They think that Imam Hussein is talking to them. And they call out, No, by Allah, Hussein, we will never give you water. Hussein repeats again, Yes, yes, give me the water. They don't realize that Hussein is seeing his grandfather, Rasulullah. And his grandfather is calling him to him. He's saying, Hussein, hurry up and come to us. 
We have the water here that you so desire. We can quench your thirst here from the Jose Kofar. Hurry up and come to us, we'll quench your thirst. And Hussein is reaching out and saying, yes, give me the water. These enemies, as they come close to Imam Hussein, they're trembling. The first one that comes forward to kill Imam Hussein, he can't bring his strength to do it, and he runs back. Zainab is watching. This Malun Shibna Ibn Dhul Joshan, he pushes this first man out of the way and he says, I'll be the one to do it. He straddles Imam Hussein, grabs his holy head by his hair, and pulls back his head. <coughs> you know, in Islam, when you slaughter an animal, there's certain rules. Number one, before you kill an animal, you should give it water to drink. It's mustahab. If you have an animal that you're going to kill, make it zabiha, halal, for us to eat, you should first give that animal a little water to drink. A second thing that's mustahab is that you should never let the animal see the knife that you're going to use against it. You should hide this weapon so that the animal doesn't see it. But Imam Hussain alayhi salam, they don't even obey these mustahabat for this remarkable and holy human being. They kill Imam Hussain alayhi salam while he's thirsty. They flash the swords before his eyes. And after killing Imam Hussain with a few strokes of their sword, Zainab is watching, they behead Imam Hussain. Do you think any of this broke Zainab? This witnessing of this scene only strengthened Zainab's resolve against these enemies. Such that her preaching was so powerful that before that caravan reaches to the court of Yazid, the people of that surrounding area already know what's happened. Zainab's preaching is so influential in the court of Yazid that Yazid's wife goes to him and grabs him by the collar and says, what have you done? What have you done? Have you the one that have killed Hussein? Yazid has to lie to his wife and say, no, I didn't order this. It was Ibn Ziyad who went above and beyond my orders. The fact that Yazid has to lie to his wife is proof of the victory of Imam Hussein. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And it's proof of the victory of Hazrat Zainab. So whenever anyone comes and speaks to you about the position of women in Islam, then we should be able to point to these examples of ours. Hazrat Khadija, Hazrat Fatima to Zahra, and Hazrat Zainab al-Kubra. Salamu Allah, Salamu Allahi Brothers and sisters, we have a very important duty in regards to this message of Imam Hussein. This message that is brought to us by men and women. That as followers of this religion and followers of Ahlul Bayt and followers of this madhab, we have to get this message out to the society around us. And the best way to do that is by our example. And the best example for our women is that strong example, that mujahida example of Hazrat Zainab al Kubra. Salamu alayha. Wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al Alim al Azim. Wa la natullahi ala a'da illa ajma'in. Salawat. Allah.